Lisa brought a new issue to us. She had a bull put credit spread for the 7th of January expiration. Sold the 475 put, bought the 470. She rolled this position into the January 14th expiration with the same strikes, 475 to 470. Now she had also at that time an additional 14th of January expiration bull put where she sold the 480 and bought the 475. Now that she rolled the initial position into a new position, she has a clash of 475 options. You can't be long and short the same strike in the same expiration in the same account. The 475's canceled out. She now has a January 14 spread, sold a 480, bought a 470. It's now a 10 point spread. And she was concerned, did she make a mistake? Are there any advantages to rolling into an existing spread or any disadvantages that hurt her portfolio? We do not know Lisa specific. So we're going to assume an entry date for both spreads around the time that SPY was getting near to 480. It looks like she did at the money bull put credit spreads. So we're going to look around the December 31st entry when the stock ETF was around 475, moving up to 476 or so, and then jumped higher. But on the 31st, the 7th of January prices at the close, we could have sold the 475 put for 262, it bought the 470 for 117. This is a net credit of 145 on a five point spread against the true risk. That represents a 40.8% return. Let's assume again that she did this 14th of January initial 480-475 spread at the same time. Could have sold to open the 480 at 660, bought to open the 475 at 416, net credit of 244 or 95.3% return. This is actually a slightly in the money bull put credit spread. Now the first assumed position. And the SPY on December 31st closed around 474.96. So the 475 was right at the money. Had a midpoint of 262, but a probability above of only 49.8%. The delta was only at 0.502. We would commonly look for an 80, 85% or higher probability with a delta of maybe 0.15 to 0.20. On December 31st, this might have guided us to the 466 or the 465 put strike with the stock trading at around that 474.96 mark. The assumed position number two, if opened at the same time, again using closing prices, SPY closed at 474.96, the 480 put out of the money by about five points was trading at 660. It only had a probability above of 40.4% and a delta of minus 0.657. Again, different from what we look for with an out of the money put position for the higher probability of being assigned. If we did open an SPY position following those other guidelines, on December 31st, we might have looked at the 462 and a half or the 462 strike for the January 14th expiration. The dilemma, SPYs we saw started a decline. It crossed below the SMA 20 on January 4th. On January 6th, SPY closed at 467.94. On January 7th, it closed at 466.09. We're short the 475 put and long the 470. So we're near full loss in this position as both puts for that 7th of January expiration are now in the money. Let's say that on January 6th, SPY closed at 467.94, which it did. Lisa brought us this question on the 7th open forum Q&A session. So let's go the day before when she said she rolled the spread. So on January 6th close, we had a 475, 470, January 7th expiration. We could have bought to close the January 475 put for 672. Sold to close the January 7th 470 put at 254. The liquidation value of the spread is at 418, not quite the maximum loss of the full five points, but getting close. If we paid 418 to close this position, we still keep that initial net credit of 145. So we have a liquidation loss, which is part of the role that Lisa would have had to do of 273. 
At that same time, just using closing prices, the 475-470 spread that she would have rolled to to the 14th of January expiration the following week, the 475 was at 692. Hey, we gained 20 cents from the buy to close price of 672. But the 470 put would have been at 328. It's an increase of 74 cents from what we sold to close the 470 put for at 254. In this spread, January 14th, 475, 470, we get a new net credit of 364. Keep in mind, both puts are still in the money. We have that liquidation loss into our account of 273, closing the January 7th position. So the adjusted net credit for this roll to the same strikes is 91 cents, less than the original 145 we collected for the first spread. Here's how that new position would look. We're now short the January 475 put at 692. Bought the 14th of January 470 put at 328. Minus the liquidation loss of 273 on this position gives us an adjusted net credit, 91 cents, or a 22.2% return against the new maximum risk of 409 on the five-point spread. But we're still in the money, and this position may have to be dealt with again in a couple of days. Now, let's take a look at our new position number one, and initial position number two, and what are the combined totals? After the roll, new position number one, now at the 14th of January, has a 91 cent net credit, margin requirement of five points. Per one contract, we took in $91. We have $500 margin requirement for the spread. The true risk is 409, even if we take the five point loss, because we keep the 91 cents adjusted, no matter what happens, with a return of 22.2%. That initial position for the 14th of January, that 480 put sold and the 475 bought had the net credit of 244. Margin requirement of five points. Per one contract, we took in $244 net credit for a 500 monetary requirement for the difference in the strike prices. The true risk, as we keep the 244 net credit, is only 256, a potential return of 95.3%. Combining them together, 91 net credit adjusted, 244 initial for position two. We have a total net credit of 335. We have a five point margin requirement on both spreads, so our total is 10. Per one contract monetary amount, we have a 335 net credit for $1,000 of margin requirement. The true risk, $665 if we lost the full amount on both spreads together. So that would give us a 50. 0.4% return. But the dilemma was, we cannot be long and short the same strikes in the same account. We now sold a 475 put for our adjusted January 7th to January 14th spread, and we were short the 480 but bought the 475 and that initial spread number two. The 475s have to cancel out. Essentially, we just kind of sold to close that 475 put and bought a 470. Lisa now has a 480, 470, 10 point spread. Again, what happens? We're long the 475 put in that initial January 14th position. We rolled from our January 7th, 475, 470, to a January 14th where we sold the 475 again. They have to cancel out because we can't be short and long. So now what do we have? We're still short the 480 put that we sold potentially on December 31st. We're long a 470 put that we just added with this roll from the January 7th position. And there's no 475 obligations. Our broker essentially saw this as we wanted to sell to close that 14th of January 475 put after we bought to close the January 7th 475 as well. Now, Let's walk through the math. Ready? Initial spread number two. Again, sold the 480 at 660, bought the 475 at 416, 244 net credit, 95.3% return. We rolled that initial 475, 470 spread for January 7th into the January 14th, selling a 475, buying a 470. 
Effectively, we sold to open the 14th of January, 480 put for 660. We buy to close the 14th of January, 475 at 692. And we buy to open the 470 put for 14th of January for 328. The money in 660 initially for our 480 put plus the 692 that we sold the 475 put for. The money out the 416 that we initially paid for the 475 January 14th put and the 328 for the new position. We have 1352 in, 744 out. New net credit, $6.08. New strike difference is $10. Maximum risk is 392 for a percent return of 155.1. Money in and money out. What are we forgetting? The initial liquidation loss of trade number one. We had to buy to close that 7th of January 475 put at 672. We then sold to close the 7th of January 470 put at 254. 418 liquidation value kept the initial net credit of 145, so we have a loss on that first spread of 273. Now, money in and money out for a new position, we have a total net credit of 608 minus the liquidation loss of 273. Our adjusted net credit is 335 on our now 480, 470 spread, 10 point strike difference. So the maximum risk is 665, that percentage return of 50.4%. Now that looks familiar, doesn't it? If we just were able to keep the two spreads open, the combined totals of the $0.91 cents adjusted net credit and the $2.44 initial net credit for spread number two is $3.35. We have two spreads with a five-point margin, so the margin requirement goes to 10. Per one contract, if we could keep both positions open, $3.35 total net credit, $1,000 total margin, true risk of $6.65. Now, the risk-reward with rolling, the cancellation of our 475s, and having a new 10-point spread, we have a new net credit of 608 minus the liquidation loss from spread number one of 273, adjusted net credit of 335, 10 point strike difference per one contract, maximum risk 665 for a 50.4% return if and only if SPY is above 480 on the 14th of January. So, what does this come down to? Well, although it was confusing, a little bit for me, because I had never seen this before or done this before, evaluating rolling one spread into an existing laddered spread to the next week out on the same security. But there was no extra benefit and there was no extra risk. The question is whether rolling and merging the spread strategy reduced the exposure risk in my portfolio or is any other benefits? And the answer really is no. In this scenario where the roll canceled out part of the other trade and made a 10-point spread, the risk reward is the same as if you could have had both spreads open, the initial spread number two and the rolled spread number one. This is common in management such as this because the money in is sort of equal to the money out, and it didn't give you any benefit in this case. However, that being said, I feel I must warn on the strike selection and the choice of the roll and other aspects, even though we do not know the exact specifics for Lisa's trade. And in this structure, there are many things we don't know. We don't know the full story of Lisa's position, the time frame either trade was entered, the net credits that were received, the time when trade number one was rolled. But we do know the chart of SPY. And since Lisa rolled her January 7th just out to the January 14th, we can also make a broad assumption that Lisa's purely looking at weekly spreads and sort of a laddered spread position on SPY. With that in mind, what we do know is the recent chart of SPY. It never went above 480, though it flirted with it just at the beginning of 2022. And it was really only above 475 in the last month or so for a few periods of time, not really extended. Yes, an at-the-money credit spread or at-the-money debit spreads gives a higher potential return. And as we saw with the January 14th initial assumed spread, not necessarily Lisa's spread, 
If opened on December 31st, we took in a credit of 244 for risk of 256. It's a one-to-one -one risk reward ratio. But it only has about a 50% probability or less of expiring worthless. It's not the preferred structure we'd like to use with credit spreads, especially with weeklies. We feel the probability is too low. We prefer to look for an 80 or 85% probability or higher, maybe a delta on the sold option of 0 0.20 or lower to have the higher probability, although we admit the risk reward ratio is higher, but it gives us a better chance of the spread expiring worthless and not having to manage the position. Using that same assumed entry date of December 31st, when SPY closed at 474.96, we saw that a potential trade was to open the 7th of January 475 put, had a midpoint of 262, but only a probability above of 49.8% and a delta of 0.502. Again, we might commonly look for an 85% probability, a delta less than 0 0.20, maybe between 0.15 and 0 0.20. On that day, using the same closing prices, we would have probably sold to open SPY January 7th, 466 put for 60 cents, delta of 0.152. Buy the 461 put for 29 cents. This is just a net credit of 31 cents and a percentage return for a seven day trade of 6.6%, but it carries an 84.8% probability of being above 466 in the seven days to expiration. Quick tale of two spreads. On the 6th of January, SPY was at 467.94. We saw the assumed put roll closing the 7th of January 475.470 spread for loss of 273, which was 77% roughly of the maximum loss in the position with that 145 net credit taken into account. Originally, it only had a 49.8% probability, delta of 0.5. A potentially more preferred spread on the same day, December 31st, we would have opened the 7th of January 466-461 spread, only a 6.6% return, but with an 85% probability, a delta of 0.152. SPY is at 467.94 on the 6th of January, close to the 1% rule, but I don't need to liquidate yet. And as we went through into the 7th of January, SPY did come down to 466. We might have closed early for 10 cents or so and still kept 21 cents of the initial net credit that was received, not risking it going in the money as it was so close to the sold put strike price in the last moments of trading. December 31st, spread two. Remember, we might have opened the 14th of January, 480 put for 660, bought the 475 for 416. Net credit, 244, true risk of 256, a potential 95.3% return. Probability above was only 40.4%. The delta was at minus 0.657. Current price on January 12th is 471.02. This initial 14th of January spread is near full loss of 256 in two days. Now, yes, she is in a current spread of 480 to 470, which we received with the roll of 335 total net credit. But right now, the liquidation loss, including that net credit coming in, would be around $8 or so. And the loss, if liquidated, would be 526, as the 480 is still deep in the money. That's a 79% loss of the maximum loss of the position, which was 665. On December 31st, we may have opened a 14th of January bull put spread selling the 462 and a half for 146 buying the 45750 for 101 this would give us a total net credit of 45 cents 9.9 percent .9 return for a two-week trade probability above 84.5 percent delta 0.155 on the short option currently on january 12th spy is at 47102 position is set to expire in two days this might have been adjusted or managed on January 10th. SPY did hit a low of 456.60, but it closed at 465.50, still above our sold put strike price of 462.50.
Now, this is not really to say that Lisa did anything wrong. Everyone has their own risk-reward tolerance. We just wanted to bring to light our preference of these positions that although at the money bull put credit spreads just slightly out of the money for seven days out might give a higher return and closer to the one-to-one risk-reward ratio. But that is extremely risky, not only because of the losses that we've seen that came with an at-the-money position, but also the fact that that can be assigned early at any time. This isn't like SPX where it can't be assigned. We could have been assigned on that short put for the 7th of January or the 14th of January at any time, which would have changed the structure of the trade. Uh, for further insight, though, on what we feel are triggers, management, and criteria, you can check out our video, Bull Put Credit Spreads, Triggers, Management, Criteria, plus a little bit extra stuff thrown in there, some probability calculations, protecting covered calls, and more. Or there's many more videos available. Go to our YouTube channel for power options. Use the search feature in our videos field to look for Bull Put Criteria, and you'll see other presentations on how we like to approach the Bull Put Credit Spread. You may not also want to search for bull call debit spreads and see our preference for maybe using a 30 to 60 day out out of the money or at the money debit spread as opposed to a credit spread to get more of that one-to-one risk reward ratio but putting time more on your side by going 30 40 or 60 days out we hope you enjoyed this presentation as always if you have any questions leave it in the comments here on youtube or go ahead and send us an email to support at poweropt.com